Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started with the high confidence malware attribution using the rich headers. Uh, we got uh, Biltzer, uh, Joyce, and Bert. Go ahead and take it over. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so just to make sure you're all in the right place, we're not talking about policy or cyber law or anything. We're here to talk about malware attribution. All right, cool. So uh, first, a little bit about us. Um, I'm Seamus. I'm still an undergraduate student. I'm a computer science and math major. Uh, a lot of my research interests lie along uh, vulnerability, now, uh, vulnerability research and reverse engineering. Uh, I spoke at DEF CON on reverse engineering Qualcomm baselines last year. And uh, these are my co-presenters. Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is Kevin. Um, I am a senior computer science major at UMBC. Uh, I am the president of the school security club, the Cyber Dogs, and my interests are in computer network operations. And I'm RJ, I'm a master's student at UMBC. I'm interested in malware analysis and data science. Um, and uh, we will be talking about the rich header today. Um, oh, and also, uh, I was a two-time Schmooza student uh, the past two ShmooCons, so uh, if you were a ShmooCon, um, sorry, Schmooza student uh, sponsor, please put your hands up. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. It was people like you who made it possible. Thank you. <laughs> it was people like you who made it possible for me to get interested in the security field, and now I'm glad that I can actually give back, and I'm really excited about this talk. Uh, and if you were a Schmooza student, please put your hands up. Awesome, awesome, nice to see you here. Uh, my challenge to both of you is hopefully you can take something out of SmoothCon because I know you're gonna have a great time um, and learn some new stuff and um, come back next year with one of your own talks. So that's my challenge. So this is kind of our uh, brief agenda for the talk. So we're gonna cover uh, PE file metadata, which is important for some background information for later in the talk. Then we're gonna talk about what the rich header actually is. Uh, it's undocumented, what it actually contains once you unobfuscate it, and why we think this is really useful. Uh, then we're gonna talk about a little bit of prior research in this area. Uh, there's not a ton, but there is a little bit. We should acknowledge that and cover it. Uh, then we're gonna talk about packers and how they actually affect the rich header and whether that makes any difference in how we can use it on uh, malware. Uh, then we're gonna talk about, we're gonna briefly cover what metadata hashing is, why it's useful, um, and then we're gonna talk about, mainly about our own metadata hash that we developed, which we feel is really useful for malware attribution. And then we're gonna cover, uh, since we feel this rich header is really useful, uh, how easily can it be tampered with and can you detect that? And then we're gonna kinda wrap everything up. So. I guess one of the, down there. Um, so before we get into the rich header, so the rich header is only present in certain PE files, so we have to go over the metadata present in PE files um, as well as why they're interesting to uh, malware analysts. So um, we'll be covering that first and then we can actually get into what the rich header is and why it's important. Um, so what is the PE file format? So the PE file format is the format of a portable executable file, which is the file format that Windows executables use. Um, and uh, they contain a bunch of metadata about um, uh, the contents of the file. Um, so some common file types that are in the PE file format are um, DLL files, EXE files, and sys files, which are like device drivers. Um, and this is like a dozen or so uh, total. Um, and the file format and the metadata within um, PE files uh, describes how the file is loaded into memory. Um, so uh, we'll be going over the contents of a PE file um, and all the metadata like headers within them. Uh, the first is kind of a standalone header called the MS DOS stub header. Uh, if you ever hex dump a PE file, um, you will see this straight at the top uh, with the string, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Um, the reason for this is that if you try to uh, load a um, PE file on DOS, um, rather than just crashing, it will print out this error message and then exit gracefully. Um, the one interesting field, and we might mention it later, um, within the MS-DOS stub header is called ELFA new. It's the uh, relative virtual address, or RVA, um, of where the rest of the PE header begins. Um, and then you can see, so basically all the other headers underneath that um, are colloquial known as the um, the PE header itself. Um, so there's a bunch of headers. There's the image file header, image optional header, um, section headers, and we'll go over those. Um, so the first one is the image file header. Um, it's at the beginning of the PE header, and it contains some basic information about the file. Uh, some useful stuff to malware analysts is the compilation timestamp, so when the file is compiled, um, if a malware actor doesn't like strip this information out or, or spoof it, uh, it can be very useful for knowing um, like if you have like two different variants of the same malware family, you can basically like, track different versions of them um, or know when the file was first written. Um, 
other things within them, there's the number of sections, which is just how many, um, we'll talk about what sections are in a bit, but how many sections are in the file. And then the last thing is a field called characteristics, which is basically a set of flags about the file. Um, it will say whether it's like an ELE, uh, exe or DLL file, for example. Um, it has some interesting information for malware analysts, like whether the file has any information stripped out of it, like re relocation information or debugging information. Um, so that can be useful for telling whether a file might possibly be. So uh, basically, if you would, um, if you take a bunch of these different metadata fields in combination, um, some may appear more often in malicious samples than not, like with information stripped out. Um, so using machine learning or just as an analyst itself, um, looking at this can be very interesting. Uh, the next field, uh, the next header in a PE file is called the image optional header. Uh, contrary to the name, it's not optional. <laughs> um, so it's present in pretty much every PE file, and it has a lot more metadata than the file header. Um, some stuff in it is um, the address of the entry point. So the entry point is where the exe uh, executable code actually begins in the file. Um, so the PE file format having this value will show where the executable code begins. Um, there's various sizes and locations of different uh, important metadata, um, like the size of the stack commit, the heap commit, um, sizes of like the code and data and stuff. And then um, the final thing is there's the major and minor versions of the linker, um, the minimum operating system and um, a subsystem needed to run the file, and then the image version, which is a user-defined field, which is basically like the version of the executable that you define yourself. Um, after this is the section table. Um, so a section is um, basically, it corresponds to a continuous area of memory, um, and there will be sections for like code or data um, or imports, at, uh, resources, et cetera. Um, and so each section will have a name. Um, often these are like, for example, the import sections like .idata or like the resource sections like .resource, um, and they will follow similar patterns. Um, it's useful for a malware analyst when you see a section name that doesn't follow a normal pattern. Uh, it's common for like packed malware, like you'll see UPX0 and UPX1 if it's packed by UPX, which is probably one of the most common packers, or by like file infectors, like the .ramnet file infector, or sorry, the ramnet file infector uses like .rmnet, which is how it got its name. Um, and so malware analysts might see unusual names and be like, oh, that's a malicious indicator. Um, the virtual address, the virtual size, and size of the raw data is also specified for each section um, in the image section headers. Um, and that can be interesting because you might see odd section sizes um, where it'll have a very small virtual address and a large uh, physical, um, sorry, a, a small section size and a large physical size, um, or vice versa, uh, where like for example a packer might have a lot of packed data but it won't be loaded into memory in that section, it'll be loaded into memory in a different section. Um, so odd um, virtual or physical sizes may indicate some weird malicious stuff going on. And then the characteristics in this case are a set of flags that are like permissions for the section, um, whether the section could be uh, written to, read, um, or modified as it runs. Um, so you will see some odd combinations in like, for example, self-modifying malware, uh, where it can, be, it can be written to and executed. Um, finally, this isn't really um, a necessary piece of the PE header. It's possible for malware, or it's possible for files not to have imports, um, but commonly they will. Um, almost all the time, and this is one of the most valuable things to look at for a malware analyst, like probably the second thing I would do after looking at strings, um, is to look at what functions are imported, um, and this can give you an idea as to what the behavior of the file likely is. Um, so for example, you can see that these are some of the imports I took from uh, IDA Pro screenshot. Um, uh, so it's a bunch of functions uh, imported from the kernel 32.dll. Um, uh, you can see that this file can do um, a bunch of different file modifications, it can sleep, um, it can, uh, you know, some other common ones might be whether it can interact with the registry, do any network operations, uh, et cetera. And so knowing what a malware sample can do from the imports is important. Um, and malware authors will often take um, time to strip out or make that information difficult to obtain. So next we have Seamus. All right, cool. So the rich header, what is it? Uh, it is uh, this undocumented, uh, unacknowledged by Microsoft, but it's inserted into every single binary built with the Microsoft toolchain. And this doesn't just mean with Visual Studio, it's really anything which uses the Microsoft linker in any capacity. So if you're using like Intel's compiler, you'll often end up with rich header data in there. Um, so it's not just limited to binaries built with Visual Studio. Uh, so it's located in between the DOS stub and the portable executable header. And it's obfuscated, so it's not especially obvious when you're first like looking through a hex dump on a binary. Um, since before we started this research, I didn't really know this was here, and I've looked at binaries a thousand times, 
It's really easy to scroll right past it if you don't know it's there. Uh, so it's obfuscated and undocumented, and it's really easy to miss. And it was first introduced right around 1998-ish with like Visual Studio 6, um, but nobody really started digging into it until around 2004. And that's when people really started get wondering what Microsoft was concealing in this. And because uh, right back around 2004, public perception of Microsoft wasn't all that great with all the antitrust lawsuits and stuff. So they were worried that they were hiding your personal identifiable information. Uh, this was spurred on by some lawsuits where Microsoft named some malware authors and the specific computers that they had produced the malware on. Um, so the rumors were further uh, spread by that. And Microsoft didn't really admit how they tracked malware authors. They just said they did it. Uh, so the, but the first article to really like dig into this was around 2008 by this guy named Daniel Pastelli who kind of reversed how some of it, how this was obfuscated and some of the contents of it. And it's really not quite as scary as Microsoft like embedding your uh, like computer's build ID and things like that into this. Um, it's a little more uh, obscure than that. So this is what it looks like. If you look at a hex dump of a binary, you'll see the uh, MS DOS stub up top, which is pretty obvious. This program cannot be run in DOS mode. And then down below, you'll see the PE header, uh, denoted by the words PE. And in between those is the actual rich header. And it kind of looks like random data. If you stare at it, it's a little more uniform because it's obfuscated by an XOR key. Uh, but you can see the keyword rich there which is really the end of the head. Um, so uh, it's obfuscated by using an XOR key, and the key is a checksum, which is built off of information contained uh, in the MS-DOS stub and the contents of the rich header itself. Um, so this is actually kind of an integrity check of sorts. You can't just copy-paste one header into another binary and expect it just to work perfectly. Uh, the checksum won't match. You have to recalculate the checksum. Uh, but once you do take the checksum and work backwards and DX or everything, you end up with a structure like this. Uh, so once the rich header is deobfuscated, it's its own structure with a header, uh, a table full of entries, and then a footer. Uh, so the header is merely just the keyword Dan S, which denotes the start of it. Uh, it's probably one of the initial developers at Microsoft who worked on the Linker team's initials or something like that. And then it's just padded out. There's no actual usable information in it. Uh, the most interesting part for purposes of malware analysis is this actual table of entries here. So each entry is split up into two major parts. You have uh, something colloquially known as the, the comp ID, and then you have the count. And the comp ID is further split into two parts, uh, the prod ID and the MCV. And the prod ID basically specifies a unique object, uh, like a certain DLL or a certain object or library used in the compilation process. And then the MCV is the, the revision of that object. So the combination of the two uniquely identifies some specific file which was used in the compilation process. And then the count is just the number of times it was used in the linking process. Uh, so once you build a binary which is, you know, imports more than like two functions, this table starts to add up and can actually provide a really unique picture of what exactly was involved in building this thing. Uh, and there, one thing, important thing to note is there are no duplicate entries. Uh, in a legit binary with a legit rich header. So a little bit more about how it's built. Um, I spent a good bit of time staring at the Microsoft compiler in a debugger in IDEPRO, and I don't recommend doing that. It's not helpful for your sanity. But uh, so when you invoke the compiler, uh, it's usually invoked through cl.exe, which is kind of the big front end to it. And then that, but the core functionality of the compiler is contained in two DLLs, C1 and C2 or C1XX for like C++. Uh, so those are the front end and the back end compiler respectively. And the back end compiler, when it's emitting final objects, the artifacts of its build process, uh, puts into it every object it generates, it puts in the prod ID and the MCV, which basically identify this and is revision. Um, so then the linker, when it's going through to build your final binary, reads in all that information into this linked list adds a couple extra features, uh, like the linker version is hard coded into every version of the Microsoft linker. So it'll actually say, this is the linker version I was linked against, these are all the objects I was built with, it keeps track of the count, the number of times they're used, and there's another field in there which is actually the overall count of objects and functions imported. Um, so it adds a few extra details, and then uh, outputs that as your finished binary. So there's been a little bit of prior research in this area, but not a ton. Uh, 
a lot of it, a lot of the initial research focused around what exactly does this hold? Is it storing you know, my social security number because it's Microsoft or something like that? And no, it's not. Um, but this is kind of some of the most notable research which actually incorporates, well, not some of it, it's pretty much all of it, which incorporates the rich header in any context involving malware. Uh, so we have this paper called Finding the Needle, which was published back in uh, 2017. And they basically did a large scale analysis. They looked at over a million binaries and found that approximately 70, 72% of them had a rich header. Um, and the rest of them were either not compiled with the Microsoft tool chain, uh, they could have been using Borland or something similar, or their header had been tampered with in some way, stripped out. Um, one other note is if you are building this with like anything with Visual Studio, for instance, there's no option to strip out this header. It's hard coded into the compiler and the linker. There's no flags to get rid of it. You either have to patch the linker not to omit it when it's building the PE header, or you have to write a tool to strip it out uh, post-build process. Um, so there's no support way to get rid of this thing. Um, so it kind of focused on how many of the binaries in existence probably have this thing. Uh, do packers affect it? And then they mainly focused on using uh, machine learning to try and like cluster malware together using this as one of the features. Uh, but their use of packers kind of intrigued us because uh, the rich header is somewhat packer resistant as we'll show later on. So we wanted to dig more into that. Um, this is probably, if any of you have ever heard of the rich header before, this might have been it. Um, this was a blog post published by uh, Kaspersky uh, back about the malware attack on the 2018 Winter Olympics. Um, and that Olympic destroyer malware had a ton of false flags in it. And one of the really interesting ones was it had a complete exact copy of a rich header from another binary which is attributed to the Lazarus threat group. So on first glance, you're saying these have the same rich header. These were probably built in the same exact environment and you can point fingers at where this came from. Uh, and it's really interesting because that's the obvious use case for the rich header is saying these were built in very similar environments. They probably came from the same build process. Um, and this was actually used in the reverse way where upon manual inspection of this header, they found out that the header did not match the contents of the binary and it was used to disprove and say that this was copy pasted in, it was a false flag. And the way they did that was they were digging into the header and it specified objects which uh, did not exist when, at the time when the binary was built or uh, vice versa. Um, so it, it basically contradicted itself upon closer manual inspection. Uh, and then this was a, a more recent blog post just on using Yara to actually match conditions based on the rich header, which is a really useful tool when you're skimming through data sets and things like that. You can base on hashes of, of it, the, the whole header or parts of it. So, okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about uh, packers, a quick overview on what packers are, what they do, and how they affect the rich header. So um, basically the results from that finding the needle paper that Seamus mentioned uh, kind of sparked our interest in viewing this a little bit more because we noticed that the rich header is relatively resistant to packers and that's kind of a, a, one of our main areas of focus. So um, packers are kind of like a, a two-sided story. They're a malware analyst uh, nightmare and a malware author's dream. Um, kind of the goal of packers is they make a, an analyst's life a living hell to be completely frank. Um, what packers do is basically they compress the data in a binary and they make it so uh, it's very difficult to statically analyze that uh, information and they put what's in what's called an unpacking stub. And what this stub does is when uh, the binary is loaded into memory and run, the unpacking stub resolves all the imports and does all the uh, fancy stuff at runtime. So analyzing the binary statically is kind of, um, I would say, useless. Um, so with the finding the needle packer, uh, the packer results from finding the needle, they surveyed five common packers and uh, three of the five packers they found to see that um, it does not affect the rich header at all. So UPX, ASPAC, and ENSYS. Uh, they also found that the other two packers either corrupted or removed the rich header entirely. So that was, again, uh, sparked our interest into viewing more packers and how they affect this uh, part of the binary. So our own findings, we actually surveyed nine common uh, malware packers and we found ASPAC, PE Compact, Petit, Thamida, and UPX do not modify the rich header at all. So it's completely unscathed through the packing process. And one thing to note with these packers is we actually ran them on the strictest options possible, stripping out as much as we possibly could. 
Um, we also found that FSG, UPAC, and VM Protect uh, inadvertently modified the rich header. And by inadvertently, we mean we did not sense any foul play. We just sensed that in the packing process, um, it just either got corrupted unintentionally or just unintentionally removed or overwritten. But we did notice something interesting with RL pack. It was purposefully modified that rich header. And by purposefully, we mean every binary we found packed with RL pack was actually had um, a valid rich header and it was copied. Um, the rich header was the exact same across all of the binaries that we packed with RL pack. So for example, with RL pack, you'll see in the first screenshot is just an example of an unpacked sample, whatever rich he header it has. And then with RL pack in the second screenshot, that is the exact byte sequence that you will see in a, in, in a sample packed with RL pack. So, and it is a valid rich header. So um, based on these two things we found, the fact that uh, many packers do not obfuscate the rich header at all, um, and um, because we know from the Finding the Needle paper that you can use the rich header successfully to cluster malware, um, we thought that this would be a prime target for a metadata hash. Um, so uh, in this section, we'll introduce what hashes are, how they're used in malware analysis, um, talk about some common um, metadata hashes that are currently used in industry, and then compare them to the one that we wrote for the rich header. Um, so some introduction on hashing. Um, many, of this, uh, many of you already know this, but uh, a hash function is a function that takes in arbitrary length data um, and spits out a fixed length digest with certain properties. Um, so the three properties of a cryptographically secure hash function are that, um, first of all, it is deterministic. If you were to put in the same data into the hashing algorithm, it will always give you the same digest. Um, secondly, um, it's not reversible, so you would not be able to take a digest and figure out what data was put in um, just only knowing what the digest was. And third, um, the, uh, the third property is that it is collision resistant, meaning that if you were to put in two different um, uh, data into the hash function, it would be highly, highly unlikely that they would have the same uh, digest. Um, so the way that uh, metadata hashes are used in, um, or the way that, there's a couple different ways that hashes are used in malware analysis. The main one is called file hashing. Um, it's used for basically sharing indicators of compromise with the community. So what you would do is you would take a malware sample and then put it into a hash function, and then you would get a digest for that file. Um, Meaning if you see another file with the same digest, it's highly, highly likely that they were the same file. So you can basically share around uh, hash digests with people in the community to say, hey, I've seen um, this file on this box, um, and we've seen it somewhere else too. Maybe these, these are the same exact file, and maybe there's some like overlapping campaign targeting these different computers, or maybe, um, oh, this has already been analyzed, so I don't have to do the work again, stuff like that. Um, the issue is that you'll get a lot of malware that's uh, polymorphic, meaning it changes itself as it runs, um, uh, and it will do the same behavior, but it will have a different, it will change its code. So the file hash changes. Um, even though most of the file is about the same, uh, there will be like small code differences. Um, other things I've seen, I've seen malware um, append random bytes to the end of it just to change its file hash. Um, so you'll have like one like ransomware sample as it's distributed, like um, you'll just, it'll like a, um, a domain distributing ransomware will just like append random bytes to the end of the file so that its file hash changes. It's harder to like actually track the malware and um, re uh, release IOCs on it. Um, so metadata hashes are kind of a solution for that, and they're also used for threat hunting, um, where what you do is rather than inputting all of the, um, the malware sample into a hash function, you just input certain unique metadata. Um, we'll go over two common um, metadata hashes used in the industry, um, but they're very, very efficient for actually doing threat hunting and um, checking whether malware samples are related to each other. So what you would do is um, you would take, say you have a million malware samples, and you want to see which ones are related. Um, or have identical certain metadata, um, you would take all of your files and then calculate the metadata hashes for each of them, and then you would index a database on the metadata hash. So what you can do is you can query that metadata hash and instantly retrieve um, all of the files that um, have that same exact set of metadata. Uh, so it's a very, very powerful technique. So the most common metadata hash out there is called import hash or imp hash. Um, so the way this one works is the metadata used um, for the hash function is uh, the um, functions, the order they appear in the import address table. Um, so for example, if a malware sample uh, has like three imports, let's say it can open a file, it can connect to a network and query a registry key. Um, uh, those three imports would be um, input into a hash function and then you get some hash out and then any, uh, any malware sample that has the same import hash um, has the same 
uh, function in the same order in the IIT. So, um, of course, most malware samples have like a couple dozen imports, um, and you'll get a very unique value um, for the metadata hash. Um, it was used to really great effect. Um, there's a great article published by um, uh, Mandiant, uh, it's on the FireEye blog now, um, on using import hashes to track APT1, uh, which was related to their APT1 report um, in, I think, 2014. Um, and so they were able to track all these different APT1 uh, malware families by their import hashes. Um, it was very, very powerful and they had a really cool article on it. Um, so um, some of the weaknesses of this, the major one is that now malware authors know the trick. They want to hide the imports from uh, analysts that they can't see exactly what they're doing. They use a uh, technique called uh, runtime linking, where uh, rather than just having all the imports listed statically in the file, um, they'll list a couple of them that are necessary to resolve all the other imports at runtime. So you can actually calculate an import hash uh, for the file at rest. Um, and then um, a very common thing that packers do is runtime linking. So packed malware will very, very commonly, um, if you were to pack a malware sample, its import hash would likely change because it uses runtime linking. Um, to obfuscate the imports. Um, after this, there's another really common metadata hash called PE hash. Um, so this is a very, very cool hash. It was developed for the purpose of um, clustering polymorphic malware. So polymorphic malware will, um, uh, polymorphic engines will commonly, like if you were to run a file, um, it will like copy itself and change a little bit of its code um, so that it has the same functionality, um, but the code will be different. So you can't signature it easily. Um, and its file hash changes. Um, so uh, there was a researcher who was having a problem in a data set where there was a bunch of this one polymorphic file infector called all Apple, and he was sick of it, and so he wrote a metadata hash um, basically so that um, any malware samples that had the same metadata, which all Apple was not changing its metadata, just its actual executable contents, um, would be matched by the hash. Um, so the way it works is the features he's used for this one are the, um, a bunch of different metadata in the image file header, optional header, and section headers. Um, it had things like the sizes and virtual addresses of the sections, um, characteristics. Um, I don't remember all of them, but there's a long list. It's a very unique hash because there's a ton of different kinds of metadata that are input into it. Um, uh, of course, this is also one of the, um, the drawbacks. Um, uh, it's a very, very strict hash with a very high um, uh, true positive rate, um, but it also has a um, high false negative rate, meaning it will miss malware samples that are actually correlated because they'll have very, very small differences in metadata, even though they're related. Um, so it does great at identifying uh, polymorphic malware in the same family, um, but if you're just using it for like trying to look up um, similar malware samples, it might not work as well, even though I still use it to pretty great effect. Um, uh, it's also not resistant to packing at all. Um, so if you were to pack a malware sample, its PE hash is almost always going to change. Um, packers commonly add or modify PE sections and their metadata. Um, so you will almost always see a um, PE hash change when you pack a malware sample. Um, whoops. Okay. So what we did is because we want, um, because we saw that the rich header um, is often not modified at all by packers, um, we thought this was a prime target for developing our own metadata hash that actually does resist packing. Um, so we called it rich PE. We didn't just take from um, the um, rich header. We also took a bit from the PE header, um, and we'll explain why we did that in a sec. So the features that we chose for the rich PE hash, and I apologize, it's a bit small. Um, what we did is um, we took features from the rich header, the image file header, and the image optional header. Um, so for each entry in the rich header, we take that prod ID and MCV, which are the um, product ID and the version of the product. Um, and then we take the count. Um, what we notice, though, is that um, often very similar malware samples will have almost identical counts, but not quite exact counts. So what we do is we mask out half the lower bits of the count so that they will, um, that will not change the, um, the hash. Um, so it's a bit more resistant to malware samples being pretty related, but not exactly. Um, and then um, to make up for this lack of uniqueness, we also add a bit of metadata from the PE header to make up for it. Um, we specifically avoided the section header, which is the most common section, or the most common area of the PE header that's changed by packers. Um, so we added the machine, which is like the architecture um, that a file can run on, the image file header characteristics, which we talked about, those are like the flags for like EXE, DLL, uh, stripped information. Um, we added in the subsystem, um, and then the major and minor linker version, operating system version, image version, and subsystem version. So when you take, so basically any malware sample that has all of these in common with another, 
will have the exact same rich PE hash, and it's great for like threat hunting where, oh, hey, I have this one interesting malware sample. Let me see if I have any others that share exact metadata with it. They're likely related. Um, it's very powerful. Like They use the technique for like tracking APD1 and tons of other APD groups. Um, so yeah, so this is how the rich PE hash is calculated. Um, of course, we wanted to test it against some packers, so we did. Um, so we mentioned there were five packers out of our set of nine um, that do not change the um, rich header at all. So we ran our hash on it just as demo. Um, so you can see uh, the first one we tried was AS pack. Um, so you can see that when you pack the file, it's MD5 changes, it's import hash changes, and it's PE hash changes, um, but it's rich PE hash does not. Um, and the same is the case for basically all the other packers that we tried. Um, so with PE compact, it actually failed to have an import hash. I'm not sure exactly what it did to the IAT, but nothing pretty. Um, you can see that the, uh, the PE hash changes, but the rich PE hash, which is our hash, did not. Uh, same for petite, as well as Thamida and UPX. So these are some of the major packers. Like UPX is the most common packer used by malware. Um, and you can cluster malware samples together based on our metadata hash using them, even though they've been packed. Um, we've got some really cool results that we're excited about to display. Uh, I'll go over those next. Um, but of course, uh, because we were making this metadata hash, we wanted to test it out and make sure it was actually resilient and actually useful. Um, so we've got some stats on that. Um, so um, gathering a data set was very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to find uh, true positive labeled malware uh, to actually make sure this is good. Um, so we have a, it's smaller than we would like. We're still looking for people to like actually give us malware and help us out with this. Oh my gosh, that's not visible at all. <laughs> oh geez. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll read everything out so that you can, uh, Wow, okay, that sucks. Um, so uh, the first data set we ran on um, was a set of um, 209 malware samples from the APT1 data set. Um, there were 38 malware families among them. Um, so the blue, kind of blue, I guess, <laughs> bar uh, was import hash. Um, so we clustered uh, the APT1 data set based on that. I can't even tell, but, uh, okay, <laughs> hold up. Is there anything we do about this? Okay, I can't tell what the number is either because I have a very like small screen. Um, so um, import hash performed the second best in terms of the average size of a cluster. Um, uh, I believe it was like 1.7 malware samples uh, per, um, per import hash clustered together on average. Um, the next best one was PE hash uh, with slightly more. Um, the third one, the gray one that you can't even see performed by far the worst. Um, that was what we did when we just hashed the rich header, which is kind of like the intuitive thing to do. Um, uh, so what we did, the, we just called it the rich hash. It was the hash of the product IDs, MCVs, and counts. Um, you can see that it's performing worse than the other three hashes, and that's because the count field, although the count field is very susceptible to small changes uh, when you have related malware samples. Um, and the one that performed the best was our hash, rich BE hash. Um, I think it was an average of 1.85 malware samples um, per cluster. Um, so this was on a very small data set, but it was actually labeled, which was valuable to us. Um, the only false positive was from import hash. There was a, um, a, there were two different families that only imported five functions in the same order. Um, and so there was a collision of the, these two families having the same exact import hash, likely because of runtime linking uh, with a very small IIT. Uh, but we wanted more data. So this was on about 650,000 files. Um, it was a mix of legitimate and malicious binaries, and we had a, a split for labeling uh, clean and, uh, and uh, malicious. Um, in this case, we actually uh, changed the results a lot. Um, oh, I can't read them. <laughs> um, so import hash was on the left, uh, performing second best in terms of cluster size. Um, the uh, PE hash performed worst. Um, I want to say that I can't read that. Um, I want to say that import hash averaged about five um, malware samples on average per cluster. Um, PE hash was like four and a half. Um, rich hash performed second best um, with I believe six averaging a cluster, and um, and the rich PE hash was about six point eight per cluster. Um, so ours had the best capacity for clustering. Um, malware, although we don't know what family they were in, so we had to measure the false positive rate and make sure that the, um, the hash was actually matching useful things. The way that we did this, and I again apologize for the slides, um, is we, um, we calculated a false positive rate based on just knowing whether it was clean or malicious. Um, so 
a clean file should never share the same, you would assume, uh, the same rich PE metadata as a malicious file. You would assume that they're independent. Um, we actually found some evidence to the contrary, but um, uh, so what we did is for any um, malicious sample that shared a metadata hash with a clean file, we count it as a false positive and we had the false positive rate over a data set of about 650,000 files. Um, so import hash, we actually were very surprised with how high these numbers were. Import hash had about a 5% false positive rate um, and we'll get into the um, reason for that because we were surprised and had to do some digging. Um, PE hash performed the best because the strictest hash, it had I believe around a 1% false positive rate uh, I think it was like 1.6 or 7, if I remember correctly, 7. Um, uh, the rich hash performed the worst. Uh, it was just over 5%. It was like 5.1 or 2, if I remember right. And then our hash was about a 2.7 false positive rate. And we were actually shocked at how high these numbers were, because in our experience, I have never seen AP hash false positive um, while I was researching malware. It turns out that um, some of the data we're using was tainted with benign files, so we, um, we actually took from a bunch of different data sets, whatever malware we could get our hands on. Uh, we took from uh, the VeriShare data set, VX Heaven, um, Contagio, and some of the files within the VX Heaven data set uh, were actually legitimate, um, and we were labeling as them malicious. The other reason is because of file infectors. So what a file infector does is it will, uh, it's a kind of malware that infects an executable file so that when that file is run, it will run its malicious contents that were injected into it rather than the benign ones. And when it does this, it often won't change any metadata. Um, so they were actually file infectors with the same exact metadata because they had infected legitimate files um, uh, unchanged and matching up with that. So um, what's important for us is we can see um, that um, our hash performed uh, at least better than import hash and worse than um, PE hash. So we believe it's at a, right, uh, a nice medium between the two industry standard hashes. Um, of course, we want to get more data to be able to test this further, um, but we're fairly confident that the metadata we're using um, is unique enough to be a useful hash. Some other cool stuff that we found. Uh, so we actually used this, uh, so we took the APT1 data set and we tried to find other things within our other data, our virus share and VX Heaven data sets um, that shared rich VE hashes with them. We were trying to track down uh, any APT malware that may have made its way into those data sets, and we found it. Uh, so what we did is we found actually two different families uh, of APT1 malware had rich VE hash matches um, in the virus share data set. Um, so we looked them up, we did a bit of investigating, and it turns out they were likely families uh, used by, or at least um, they likely would have been attributed to the same families as those APT1 malware samples. Um, another cool finding is we found uh, malware of the same family, um, one of which was packed, one of which was unpacked, and they shared the same rich PE hash. Uh, and then we found even cooler, um, we found samples of the same malware family that were packed by two different packers and shared the same rich PE hash. So that was like, really impressive to us. We were kind of astounded when we saw that. Um, so we think this is a lot of promise. We're very excited about it. Um, it still, however, has a couple drawbacks. Uh, first of all, we're still in the proof of concept stage. We're still testing this. Um, and we may end up making some changes to the hash if we see um, any updates to the false positive rate as we get more data and we do more testing. Uh, we may, we may uh, want to make it stricter or make it um, more accessible to clustering malware. Uh, we can always tune that one way or another by changing the features we use. Um, the other thing is that, remember, only about 70, 72% of uh, files actually have a rich header in them. Um, so this does not apply to all malware, although it applies to the majority of it. Um, there's definitely stuff it won't work on. And then, um, again, not all of the packers that we surveyed actually leave the rich header alone. We, out of the nine we surveyed, four um, still corrupted or modified in some way, and that would break the rich PE hash. So this isn't like an a end-all solution to packers, and as soon as like, the authors of packers start like, realizing, hey, you should probably like, start obfuscating the rich header a bit, uh, this may not be as effective, uh, but we have some countermeasures for that. So here we go. All right, so um, as we slowly but surely keep poking holes in the uh, threat actor's ship, they're always going to try to find ways around that. So uh, one of our goals of our research was to try to be more proactive and try to see ways that a threat actor might tamper this field now that it's kind of out there and how we can detect that and how uh, their thought process might, be, might look like. So, um, so again, our, our motivation as adversaries are always going to look for ways around these types of detections. And we wanted to see how easy it was and how challenging it would be to detect as well as spoof ourselves. So 
A uh, quick, uh, quick background again on the rich header checksum. So the checksum for the rich headers actually comprise, it uses the data from the MS-DOS stub header as well as the contents of the rich header and makes a checksum out of that and that's what it is XORed with. So one thing we can do is we can use that checksum uh, as kind of like a check for validity on uh, metadata in that file. So if we find that the rich header checksum has been modified in some way so it's not valid, it doesn't correspond with the, um, the rich header contents or the MS-DOS stub, we can um, basically deduce that the MS-DOS stub had been tampered with or the rich header had been tampered with. So kind of an in indicator of some sorts. Also, we noticed, and uh, Seamus mentioned it earlier, you cannot have uh, duplicate prod IDs or MCVs. So if we go and uh, deobfuscate the rich header and we see that there are duplicates, we can also deduce that there was some sort of tampering involved. Um, also with the rich header contents, typically, and I say typically, uh, very loosely, um, the rich the rich header has the linker version being the last entry in that uh, rich header table. So if, and then if you go ahead and use some of the metadata from the PE section, uh, the image optional header, uh, there's the actual major linker and minor linker versions. So if you go and try to uh, correlate the linker version in the rich header with the linker version in the PE header and they don't match up, there's kind of, uh, you can basically assume that either that it's been tampered with, either the rich header's been tampered with or the PE uh, metadata has been tampered with. Um, also, there's, a, there's an entry in the rich header called prod ID 1 or uh, import 0. And what this does is it basically um, gives you a general idea of how many imports were used in this, um, in this file. And which, what we noticed was that the uh, import 0 was never less than the number of imported functions in the IIT. And if you do see that it is less than the number of functions in the IIT, then you can deduce that some uh, foul play has been going on there. And it's actually pretty cool uh, talking when I go back to the Kaspersky article and kind of mention that. Um, so this is kind of the thought process we went through with spoofing a rich header. So if we had file one and file two, and you take the deobfuscated um, rich header from file one and you wanted to insert that into file two. So what you would do is you would use the contents of that rich header from file one and then your new files MS-DOS stub, you would calculate your new checksum. With that, you would XOR the contents of the rich header that you would like to insert into file two with that new checksum and then you'd overwrite the uh, rich header in file two where you want to put it. And then again, you need to make sure that the PE, meta, the PE metadata matches up with the rich header, so you would need to edit the image optional headers, major and minor linker versions to correspond with the rich headers entry. And then we would have to modify the import address table to pass the uh, import zero count check. So we need to make sure that um, the import, the IIT count is less than the import zero. So you could kind of do that with runtime linking. So how feasible was this? Um, passing most of the metadata checks is trivial. Um, what I actually did in practice was I took an APT1 sample and, I, and an APT29 sample and I actually took the rich header from an APT1 sample and inserted it successfully into an APT29 sample and it did pass a lot of those basic metadata checks. Um, but the problem with that is altering the IAT is a bit complicated uh, because of a bunch of factors there. But um, one thing we did notice is that spoofing the rich header, uh, no matter what, uh, if you have a manual or a malware analyst that is going to manually analyze the, uh, the binary itself, it's going to be very difficult to stand up to that and have an analyst who's been doing this for 20 or so years not pick up on that. Um, and so that's actually what happened with the Kaspersky article that we mentioned with the Olympic Destroyer. Um, they actually found what's called mscore.dll was used in that binary, but the, the rich header was actually said it was compiled with Visual Studio 6, which is about 1998, but mscore.dll, the DLL that they found was used, wasn't available until after 2010. So that's kind of how they figured out that this was a false flag. So uh, some uh, test stats that we ran, we actually wrote a script that kind of, uh, we ran across a bunch of malware to kind of see if anything was spoofed. And I, again, we apologize for the graphs. Um, we found that there were, look, bear with me, there was about 6% of the malware that we ran. This is about 500,000 or so uh, pieces of malware. About 6% had an invalid checksum. About a little under 1% had uh, duplicate entries, the duplicate prod ID or MCVs. Um, about 15% had conflicting linker versions, meaning the linker in the rich header did not correspond with the PE header. And about 5%, the import zero count did not, um, did not ma was actually less than the IIT count. So, um, 
to poke fun at our uh, favorite antivirus solution, Kaspersky, um, we actually got access to the Olympic Destroyer uh, malware that they had, and we ran it against our test. And it actually passed the checksum, duplicate entries, and linker tests, so we're all square there. But our test actually picked up that it failed the import count test. So if Kaspersky would have had our script a little while ago, they probably would not have had to um, manually analyze the binary. They could have used our script to find out that it was spoofed. And uh, more specifically, the rich import count was, uh, was 77 but in the uh, Olympic Destroyer binary, but the IAT import count was 93, and that's significantly less than, so. Okay. Um, I'm going to quickly wrap up. So one thing we found with RLPAC, it um, inserts, it purposely overwrites and inserts a byte sequence uh, on the rich header with every piece of malware we packed with it. Um, so it actually passes all of our tests, unfortunately. <laughs> And it actually goes back and, and sets the PE header linker version to correspond with the rich header. And it does not have an import zero entry, so we can't really check that. And that's um, uncommon, but it doesn't necessarily point to the fact that uh, something is wrong. So. so just to kind of quickly wrap it all up, since we're uh, running a little short on time. But uh, we're actually pretty surprised by some of our results, especially the fact that we can match samples packed with completely different sets of packers and say these were from the same family, these were built on the same computer, and things like that. Um, we were also pretty psyched that we found uh, previously not publicly uh, attributed malware in just random data sets. We thought that was a pretty neat result. Um, so we're pretty excited to keep continuing this research. Uh, we're always looking for access to like more packers and more malware, uh, since those are kind of hard for students to get access to, unfortunately. Uh, so some quick acknowledgments. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nicholas for letting us use his lab, even though we're not actually like his grad students or anything. Uh, he's pretty cool. Uh, we also like to thank both Nicholas and uh, Dr. Zhang, as well as Bill and Matt from APL for just giving us some general pointers in our research. Um, this wasn't like university funded grad research. We were kind of doing this on our own time, but they were kind enough to give us some pointers. Uh, we also like to thank the Shadow Server Foundation for giving us access to their data, as well as uh, Contagio. I emailed and got access to some of that, which was a huge help. Um, and uh, we are gonna release the code on GitHub if anybody wants to play with it. We'll be doing that later today after the talk. Um, so, any questions? Yes. Given that Sure. So the question was, given the fact that individuals have a tendency to kind of stay consistent with each other, uh, would someone creating a false rich header uh, be its own fingerprint, essentially? Is that what you're asking? Would you be able to identify those individuals or groups then as opposed to an individual virus or malware? Sure. You right. um, that's a good question. We'd have to do a bit of more investigating on that one. Um, my intuition would say yes. Um, but it would probably take a fair amount of analysis to actually catch that in the first place. Good question. Uh, any other questions? Oh, there's one. Oh, yes. Can you go back a slide? Sure. Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we will be posting the slides too um, with hopefully more readable graphs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. So the question was, um, did, you, did we look through legitimate files as well to look for any odd stuff in the rich header? And the answer is yes. Uh, so we had about 330,000 legitimate files to work with. Um, a little under 1% had an invalid checksum. We're not actually sure why. And then about the same amount, just under 1%, had an invalid um, linker version, I believe. Um, some of the files had multiple linker versions. We actually had to like, screw with our script a bit for that. Um, and so that was odd. We don't know why that's happening yet. A lot of those legitimate files were from Microsoft, too. So we're not sure what's going on over there. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Sure. So for, for really high-end, like, you know, nation-state type hackers, are they, are they sort of able to bypass some of, you know, the search editor analysis? Um, they, they 
So the question was kind of, if you're a nation state with lots of money to throw at this problem, can you kind of get around it? Um, and uh, the more you have to put a lot of effort into faking this very convincingly, because a lot of the checks you can make uh, in an automated basis, just like validating checksums and stuff. All right, uh, we're kind of out of time here. Uh, they told me to stop, but I can answer your question on the side stage. Uh, so. We're done. All right.